who will be in verses 33 to 46. And this morning's sermon is titled, Raising Lazarus. Raising Lazarus. So as we begin, let's read the portion of the scripture. Verse 33, this is God's infallible and errant and inspired word. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who, had wh- who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and the stone was, was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that you would, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you have always, you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said, so that they may believe that you sent me. We, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to him, to them, unbind him and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done, believed in him. And some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Pray with me. Father, this morning, our desire as always is to worship you. That all the things in life would be drowned out and we would understand that this time belongs to you. Our lives belong to you. And Lord, we thank you that your word that you've given us, your revelation of yourself, the inspired, inerrant, and perfect word, Lord, that you speak to us through it, that you tell us the true things of life, the true things of death, the true things of love. And in so doing, that you would move us but you would help us, Lord, to understand and to know what your Spirit desires to teach us, that we would be removed even from our own thinking and that we would think upon what you want to communicate to us. Lord, teach us, change us. Do not leave us the same, Lord. We are helpless without you. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. To to drop into this portion of Scripture... There's, there's so much that already has happened, and and I, I feel bad if you haven't been here. This is It's almost like I'm dropping you in the middle of the forest, and all you see is trees. I hope this morning that as we kind of, I kind of expound on this portion of Scripture, that you would see more than just the trees, you would see the forest. They would see that, in a sense, the big picture of all of all these things that have been happening up until this point. There's, there's, there was a, a, a run up into this because we know what's about to happen. We've read this portion of scripture, and sometimes the familiarity it makes it difficult for us to see with fresh eyes, to understand what Christ is trying to tell us. Our flesh gets in the way. Our own understanding gets in the way. Our our preconceived notions of what he did and why he did it get in the way. But this morning, I pray you would take a pause because Jesus has now arrived in Judea. Jesus has now arrived in Judea where only a few weeks before that, maybe months, they wanted to murder him. 
And he's back at this place. And he will do the most miraculous thing that anyone has ever done, that has ever lived. Raise a man from the dead. He has this interaction with Martha. You know, we've we seen this last week. It's, it's this, this beautiful thing of, of seeing yourself in some of these people. <laughs> And seeing Martha for who she is, and she's she's precious. She's precious to Christ. But but you see this, Martha, Martha. You know she's she has this idea. She's Lord, if you had been here, she says, he would not have died. My brother would live right now. Martha, Martha. You don't understand these things, Martha. The conversation turns, and I love how it turns from this this mourning, this grief, to this deeply theological conversation, this conversation that takes you back to an understanding of who God is. And, And we see it. Look at verse 23. It says, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. You know, at that point, I I I always think about these things. You find the drama in the text. And you see, when Jesus said this, it should have ended the conversation, right? Martha, your brother will rise again. It didn't end the conversation. But I love this because it, when she responds, since she responded, and since he knew that she was going to respond, it gives us two of the most glorious verses in all of Scripture. I, I love John 3.16. I love Colossians 1. I love all these passages. I look at the scriptures and I think, but this right here, this right here, what he says to Martha speaks volumes. It, it actually speaks directly to everyone here in the sense of calling out unbelief. He says in verse 25, look what he says. This is his response. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies this is this is it this is the whole reason that christ has entered the, our world condescended humiliated himself to be placed in a human body and then to tell us i hold life in my hand verse verse 26 he goes for this is everyone who who lives and believes in me will will never die. And the question, do you believe this? Do you believe this? You know, Martha responds. It's beautiful. Martha responds, yes, of course she believes. She says, of course I know that you're the Son of God. So this run up into our passage, this this raising of Lazarus, why is this happening? Is, is there a bigger picture? And there is. Verse 14 kind of draws our attention to that. As Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. Verse 15, I am glad for your, for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe what is the purpose of Lazarus' death is that you and I would believe, that they would believe. Even earlier, look at verse 4, it says, but when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, which is true, it did not, but what? But for the glory of God. For the glory of God. Jesus has been saying that he would demonstrate his glory and his power in defeating death. Not just even physical death, he's talking even defeating spiritual death. For many of us, think about this personally. For many of us, our our faith has worked backwards. We could look back at our lives and see that, that, that you see the hand of God tracing every moment that he would bring you to the end of yourself and that you would turn to him. You know, this working backwards, 
you know, it's, it's, we look back and we think, wow, how stubborn was I? How stubborn was I? How stiff-necked and, and, and ignorant was I to not see what was right in front of me? And even now I pray that, that our eyes, our ears, our hearts would be open to see the glories of Christ. Because it's easy, again, I'm telling you, you've read this passage. It's easy for you to look at this and say, I know this, I understand this. Can I tell you, look, as expositors, as preachers, that was hours in this text. I could, I could preach a three-hour sermon this morning. And I will. I'm kidding. I won't do that. But I could because there's so much. And, and, and what is the challenge as an expositor? To give you what I believe is pertinent in the moment? To just tell you what the text says plainly? To explain the simplicity of it without getting too complex? Yeah, that's the challenge. Because I would want you to think and say, I need to know more about this. I need to see the face of Christ in this passage. I don't need to enter this passage and just think, I know what he did. I want you to believe. And, and I'm talking to you, church. I'm not talking just to the unbeliever among us. I'm saying, church, I want you to believe. I want you to believe more. Because this truth grows faith. And this truth grows maturity. If you set aside these things, what happens is it becomes easy for you to just say, well, okay. He raises Lazarus from the dead. And we shrug our shoulders and think, well, what do we do with this? But as Jesus moves in our passage to do what he's always planned to do, even from eternity past, he's planned to do to raise Lazarus from the dead, this miracle will underscore the reasoning for all his entry into this world. Because it's the greatest picture of, of your dead in sin and my death in sin, my spiritual raising from the dead. You know, a lot of people would say, well, no, it's, it's, this is standalone. No, Jesus does, listen, Jesus does nothing. He did nothing on this earth that would waste analogies. You understand that? He didn't raise Lazarus just to say, well, yeah, look at me, just, I just raised this guy from the dead. He didn't do it for that reason. He did it for a grander reason. And if we don't see it, then we miss the point. You miss, you miss the forest for the trees. As a matter of fact, you see a leaf. You don't even see a forest. So as, as we land and we're in this forest, I want you to see that, that the major points and and these are my major points for this, this morning, and I, and, and I double alliterated for you to kind of see the big picture. So these are the three. One is rage to remorse. The second one is request to rebuke. And the last one is remove to restore. So rage to remorse. What am I talking about here? I'm not using the word remorse as in the sense that like Christ, you know, thought that he had done something wrong. It's not remorse in, in that sense as guilt. But as we, we pick up from last week and last Sunday, Jesus arrives in Judea and he's met with Mary, uh, with, with Martha, I'm sorry. But in, in our passage, now we get to this this area where he he meets with, with Mary, finally. And he sees her in her grief. 
He sees her in her genuine grief. And then he sees the, the Jews, the ones that maybe even were hired to come and grieve with her because that was the custom. You would hire people to come and, and weep and wail at your family's funeral. So their, their grief was not genuine. It was hypocritical. It says in verse 33, look at verse 33. It said, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, that's Mary, and the Jews who had came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And I explained to this last week, I said, this, this word, I think it's, it's, it's one word in the Greek, deeply moved. It's one word in the Greek, but it doesn't mean that. For us, it kind of means like if we were at a funeral, you say you were deeply moved or troubled, you, would, you were moved to emotion or grief, but that's not what this means. I believe the NASB actually probably got this wrong. The, the, the meaning of this word is indignation, rage. Uh, another definition for this would be that he was agitated. The literal meaning means snort. You may see a bull snorting. That's what it meant. You know, our, our perfect and sinless Savior enters this situation, and we think, what do you think about Jesus? You think, well, he's meek and lowly. He's obviously going to show up at a funeral, and he's going to have one emotion, which is compassion and empathy, which he will have, but that's not him, because he knows the hearts of everyone there. He responds as God, because he is God. So he's indignant, agitated, angry, Angry at what? The hypocrisy? He's angry at the consequences of sin, which is death. He's angry at the pain that this death has caused the people that he loves. It's all these things. The humanity of Christ shines brightly. And it, it, it will only... It will not be the end of the how he expresses himself before his believers. And even among onlookers. We see this as our Lord moves from rage to remorse, or better yet, to sympathy and empathy. You know, Isaiah 53, 3 tells us of this, right? It says that Christ was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. We've gone through three years of his ministry. Can you look back and tell me, you know, everything was good in Jesus' ministry? No. There's so much grief. There's so many fake followers. There's so many agitators. There's so many the Pharisees coming upon him, indicting him at every moment. This three years of ministry have been most literally like hell on earth. All of hell trying to come upon Christ. Thousands following him. And then back to 12. He sees this. He, he, you know, he's not moved in the sense that he's, he's responding to someone else's agitation of him. It's within him. He's perfect. So we, he moves from this, this rage to sympathy, empathy. And he tells us in verse 35, 34 actually, look at verse 34. It says, and he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then we see the shortest verse in the English language Bible. Jesus wept. Our Lord, in perfect harmony, sees where they have laid his friends. And in response, in its most honest way, it's in, 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 in without usage of words, 
he weeps. You know, this is different. The, the way Jesus, the God-man, weeps and how he responds to these things is different. You know, in, in the passages before, you, we've seen in verse 33, and it tells about Mary weeping, and it tells about the Jews weeping. And it, and it explains to us a certain thing which in the within the words itself, because the weeping in verse 33 is wailing. A, a, an exaggerated form of crying, just wailing. This, this, this exaggerated reaction but then you see Jesus, and it says Jesus wept, and the and the word that means wept, it means a, a deep inner. It's almost like you feel it so much inside. You've felt this before. Listen to me. I know you have. You feel it so much inside that it wells up, and it just becomes. It comes out of your eyes. It's not this screaming and then drawing attention to yourself. It's just you, he, he stood there and he begins to weep. Deep. You, you understand this? It's like, this is, this is Jesus. It's a simple response. It's a simple cry. A tear just falls. And it falls some more and they see him and they... You know, it's it isn't this thing. Listen, we we sin in our grief at times. I pray that we would be, we would grieve like Christ grieved. That our focus of grief wouldn't be so self-centered at times, because it is a lot of times. But our focus of grief would be outward. He would see the pain that is being caused to the people around him that he loves, that it it comes out of his eyes, that he can't help it. Deep. A type of emotion that causes us to feel something that is not superficial. And this Jesus felt and he it caused him to sorrow. The turn would be to Matthew twenty six. Kind of expound on this. Because a lot of times, I guess, even as, as men, you guys here before me, and there's um, sometimes we take too much pride in the fact that we don't feel this kind of emotion. I think it's, it's a huge error in thinking of, of at least the American Christian man that he would say, I, I'm not allowed to cry. You know, if, if you don't feel this kind of, emo of emotions, you don't feel a depth of love for the people around you. I mean, have you felt enough that you would shed a tear for your kids, for your spouse, shed a tear for another person in this church? It says, this is the Bible says that weep with those who weep. Men, I tell you that you are not to do that. Blessed are those who grieve, right? Blessed are those who, who groan over their own sin. Don't do that. Don't suppress that. Jesus didn't do that. Look at, look at Matthew 26. Let's look at verse 38. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane. There's, this is the night before Jesus is going to be crucified. And he, he shows up in, this, in, the, in the Gethsemane. He's praying. And it says in verse 38, it says, Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. He asks his disciples one thing. He says, Remain here and keep watch with me. And it says, and he went, verse 39, he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father. Listen, 
Do you feel the pain in that prayer? Do you feel the grief? My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. This is, this is your Savior. If it, look at, if feeling something is good enough for Him, it's good enough for me. Deep devotion, deep love for God should have you think about these things and think to yourself, when, when was the last time I wept around the people that are lost in my life? Have I pleaded with God? Have I seen the, the depths of what sin does in a person's life? Someone dies and you have, you have no feelings? You allow yourself to not feel things? Compassion would tell you that you are wrong. Jesus arrives here and he's feeling the gambit of emotions. Rage. Love. Sympathy. Empathy. You know, this is the well-rounded man. No one, but listen, no one has felt grief. No one has felt grief like Christ has felt grief. No man on this earth has felt grief like he's felt grief. Yet, with two comments, Christ will return back to rage. Look at verse 36. It says this, it says, well, first, yeah, verse 36, it says, so the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. But some of them could not, uh, could not this man, they said, who opened the eyes of the blind man, right? That's chapter 9. Have yet, have kept this man from also dying. You have this mixed response. I mean, I would almost sound like it's from the point, from our standpoint, we would look at it and I'd say, well, what do they mean? It says, yes, see how he loved him. He did love him. But is, is, who is this coming from? Is this a mockery? Because verse 37 tells us, yes, it was. Could not this man who opened the blind man raise this man from the dead, kept this man from dying? Couldn't he have done that? And Jesus will, within him, feel this rage all over again. Verse 38, so Jesus, again, deeply moved within. That's the same word. B.B. Warfield said this, the theologian said this, and I quote, Jesus approached the grave of Lazarus in his state, not uncomfortably in an uncomfortable grief, but an inexpressible anger. The emotion which tore his breast and clamored for utterance was just rage. It is death that is the object of his rage. And behind death, behind him death, who has the power, who has the power of death, which is him, and whom had come to this world to destroy it. Tears of sympathy may fill his eyes, but his soul is held by rage. And in, in his advance to the tomb, in Calvin's words, B.B. Warfield, quoting Calvin, says this, as a champion who prepares for conflict. Tears, rage, Combined perfectly. These emotions are real and they're perfect. Unlike ours. 
What do I mean by perfect? Why was this rage? Why was this grief perfect? You know, theology, this is kind of the thing we're not going into a rabbit hole. There's a theological term about God called impassibility. Meaning that God within himself doesn't have passions, doesn't have feelings. Before you come at we the axes, let me explain. Jesus did have real feelings here. He had a real rage. He had a real grief. He wept. This was real. He wasn't playing. He wasn't acting. But much like us, our responses, our emotions are responses from outward things. Things that would move us to those things. In Christ, those emotions were in Him alone. No one caused him to have these emotions. He had them within himself. Why is it important? Because immutability is true. God is unchanging. If you, if the Pharisees or the death of Lazarus could change Christ, then Christ is not immutable. But the emotions that he's feeling now are within him. They're in him. It's not like us. You understand this? You get angry if someone does something to you. You feel love if someone responds back to your love. But Christ is all sufficient within himself, and he's feeling these things within himself perfectly. We can't say that we, had, we could have rage without sin, right? But Christ could have rage without sin. Christ could have empathy without an outside influence. This is what's going on. Do you, do you understand the grandeur of your God? The grandeur of Christ? And, and this, is, this is how he's a, a, acting upon all these things that are happening. You see, he's not surprised by, what, by what's going on. He's not surprised by what is happening. He's not changed by it. He's not altering his own nature. He's not doing that. Jesus is not carried away by his own feelings. He truly owns them. Though we don't. You know, I, I imagine this. I want you to kind of think about this. Imagine yourself a, a cliff. And there's someone hanging on the side of a cliff, and they're on that last branch, and they're going to die. You have a rope. You're on the top of the cliff. You could throw the rope down and save him, but what you decide is, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show empathy. I'm going to show emotion. And what you do is you jump down to the branch with him. And you hang on the branch with him, and you say, now we're both going to die together. I understand your peril. You don't want a God like that. Do you understand that? Christ in his rage and in his sympathy, he didn't step into your, into your thinking and he didn't jump down to the branch. He felt what you felt so you can see that he is fully man. And he's the only one that can drop the rope to you and save you. And he didn't do that by going down to the branch with you. He is in full control of all who he is. He wouldn't have been able to do any of this if he decided what? Roll the stone and put me in there with Lazarus? My second point is request to rebuke. Request to rebuke. Listen. In verse 39, it moves from the story. It says, Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead for four days. So we have this request. We have, in the Greek, it's an active imperative. He, he's not, it's not he's, he's, he's giving some sort of option, like, can you move the stone for me, please? That's not what he's saying. He said, remove the stone. 
You know, I, I love that. Again, think about what's happening. Think about what just happened. The weeping, the rage. And now he, and he shows up at the tomb and he tells them, remove the stone. Jesus springs into action, right? Commanding them to do what he will do. What he could only do. I, I want you to remember something, or at least think through something. Why, why the removal of the stone? You know, let me tell you what it wasn't. It wasn't so Jesus could go into the tomb. The removal of the stone is for Lazarus to be able to come out. Remember the analogy of the cliff again? Jesus didn't move the stone, and then, and then Martha, her assumption is, oh, he's in a, he wants to go in to see him one more time. No, it wasn't for that. Remove the stone, because he's coming out. You know these allegories that we have that are real ridiculous and stupid? Why did he move the stone? Well, God wants to move the stones in your life. It, what, what is wrong with the church? Don't we understand this, the calculated understanding that he could have raised Lazarus from the dead without moving the stone, and then, and then Lazarus is trapped in the, in, the, in the grave still, and then he's just there to die again. The stone being removed is for you and for me. You understand that? That we would see what Jesus is about to do is, is remove for Lazarus. It's like, hey, I want you all to see what's about to happen. Move the stone. And she tells them it's logical. We understand this, verse 39, that it's logical for her to think the way she did. She says, Lord, by this time there will be a stench. For he's been dead for four days. You see, the, the third day, if you don't know about dead bodies, which I don't think you'd be an expert at it, which is great. But on the third day, decomposition sets in. And I don't know if you've been around a dead body that they don't embalm, because we embalm, so we kind of remove the stench from all that. But in these days, they didn't embalm. The Jews didn't embalm people. They just put spices and, and herbs to kind of mask the smell within those days that you're going to bury him. But now it's four days. doesn't matter. No amount of spice and, and flowers and whatever is going, to, is going to take away that stench. This guy is going to smell. You know what surprises me? When they move the stone, no one smells anything. Right? But he's been dead. Like I said, third day, decomposition sets in, and the smell would be unbearable. But what does Jesus do? Remember this, the title of this one is Request to Rebuke. He responds in what I would consider a soft rebuke. A soft rebuke. Look at verse 40. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you, Think about those words. Did I not say to you? We talked about this, Martha. We talked about this, Mary. Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? I told you this. I told you this. I said it. Verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will, will even though he lives, as he dies, he gives, he would live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Martha, diverting back. Why are you diverting back? Mary, why are you diverting back? I'm telling you. I said this to you. Believe my words. He says this throughout the whole Gospel of John. He tells them, I'll back it up with my works. If you don't believe my words, look at my works. My works speak for my works. My works speak for my words and vice versa. And it tells you, 
of who he is. There's no point of you thinking I could I could have some sort of distrust of Christ. He's told you these things and he's and he rebukes her. What a lovely thing. What a, what a lovely thing to actually get a rebuke. Think about this. A lot of people don't like being corrected, right? And the majority of us don't like being corrected. But if that correction draws you back to a truth and understanding of who God is, then why not receive it? Does not the word of God say, brother? Does it not say here, sister? You're in grief, I understand. But did I not say to you? And that you would see the glory of God. This is the promise. You know, we say things like, I believe God is sovereign. But I don't know about this area of my life. Like He's in control, but I don't know. You know, the, the bigger, grander thing is this idea. Is, Lord, I, I believe... I believe you can save anyone, but I don't know if you can save that person. I, I believe you can save anyone, but I don't see how you will save my spouse. I don't see it, God. Did I not tell you? He says this. You know, and we warn people, we say things like, well, you know, you don't know that person. You don't know that person, Jesus. I don't know if you could save them. You know, their life stinks. They smell like Lazarus in the grave. He stinketh. You don't know, you don't know this guy. You know, the thing is, you pause and you think to yourself, where did God save you from? Were you not in the gutter? Were you not dead in sins like the rest of us? Did your life not stink? If you answer to me right now, no. I question where your heart is about what redemption really is. Were you less dead? No. We are all like Born in Adam, dead in sins and trespasses. Move to my last point here is re remove to restore. To verse 41, he says, and He said to her, Did I not say? Do you see the glory of God? Verse 41, it says, So they removed the stone. They removed the stone. And, and in Christ begins this prayer. It's as if when we pause and we think, well, we're not encouraged to, to have these pharisaical public prayers, right? To draw attention to ourselves. But Jesus here, the Son of God, perfect and sinless, he begins to pray in public. And, and I love this because, you know, no one else can do that but him in the sense that his prayer, this prayer, this is a prayer that only Christ can, can offer. Because you think that of the elements of it, you know, it, it's, it's so centered on the work of the Trinity. He says this, look at verse 41, this latter part. He says, Father, I thank you that you... That I thank you that you have heard me. Verse 42 it says, I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it. So that they may believe that you have sent me. He calls him, he says, Father. The Greek, pater. It's like this, this loving, this loving 
response to his father and saying, O Pater, I come before you now to pray to, to do what? Number one, he gives thanks. He has a gratitude for the Father, and then he begins to say things to the Father that he wants them to hear. As a matter of fact, for their benefit. He tells them. He tells the Father, and telling him also, he says, Thank you that you have heard me. I know, I knew that you always hear me. There's no point, there's no point in Christ's ministry in his life that the Father has ever not heard him. I would even argue this when he was on the cross and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He heard him. He heard him. And here he hears him. But Jesus says, the reason I want you to, I want the Father to hear this, but I want all of you to hear this. You need to understand the connection I have with my Father, Jesus is telling them. He said it earlier, he says to the Pharisee, he tells him, God doesn't hear you, but he hears me. There's one meteor between man and God, writes the man Christ Jesus. Our entrance for God to actually hear our prayers is because of Christ and Christ alone. And we enter in this purpose of the prayer that, that they would believe. Jesus was not praying silently, he was praying aloud. Again, not for these selfish purposes, but that they would believe. That they would believe. The prompting of, of this prayer was to invoke a response from everyone that was listening. But what he does next will show that he is who he is. In the second part, the restoring, look at verse 43. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. Pause there and turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel is in this place and God shows him a vision. He says this, look at verse 1 actually. He says, The hand of the Lord is upon me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley. And it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them, among them around about. And behold, there was very many on the surface of the valley. And lo, they were very dry. Why, why does it say that? They were dead, dead. They were, they were past four days of death. They were complete and utter decomposition. Not a piece of flesh on that bone. Verse 3. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? He answers, he asks this question of God. And God asks Ezekiel this question, and these bones live. And the only answer Ezekiel can give is this one. Oh Lord God, you know. <laughs> I love that because that's one of the best answers you can give. What's going to happen, God, with all this? What are you going to do with this person in my life? Lord, you know. I trust you. He tells him this. Look at verse 4. Again, I said to him, to me, he said to me, prophesy, preach. 
Preach, Ezekiel, over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God of the, to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you will be made to come to life. Is this not what happens in regeneration? Is this not what happens when God breathes life into dead, spiritually dead people through the gospel, through the preaching of God's word? I will put snooze on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and you will know that I am the Lord. Turn back to John 11. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. No, let's not do that. Turn to Ephesians 2. We were in this passage, weren't we? Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Do you agree with that, church? I hope you do. Colossians 2. Colossians 2, verse 13. It says it again. When you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He did what? He made you alive. To yourself? No. With him. Romans chapter 5. Verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Romans 6. You know this, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. In Mark 4, before we turn back to, you don't have to turn there, but in Mark 4, Jesus had, had, had calmed the seas that were raging and the men thought they were going to die. And when Christ, with a word, calms the sea, the disciples have one reaction. They have one thing that they said, Who is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Listen, if Jesus could control the sea, can he cannot control the, the dead souls of men? Jesus said with a loud voice, listen, it wasn't like if he was trying to hide things. He wanted everyone to hear what he was about to say. He says with a loud voice, he cries out, Lazarus, come forth! And right at that time, I want you to think about this. This literal translation sounds like this. Lazarus, outside, now! It's not a suggestion. It's not as though Lazarus is now going to, he's going to implement his free will. At this time, you know what? It's get out here now. You don't have a choice. And I'll tell you this. Do you not thank 
God that in your life, when you were dead in sins and trespasses, he didn't ask your opinion. He said, repent and believe. Trust in Christ. Stop trusting yourself. He didn't ask you. He called your surrender. You're at enmity with God. God is at war with you, and he says, I want to give you peace. I want to make a peace treaty with you, but this peace only comes from my son and the sacrifice he did for you. You don't get to have an opinion. Lazarus, get out here now. You will live because I deemed it so. And when the gospel came to you and he brought life to your dead soul, your life responds and it says, I love God. I love him for this. Lazarus doesn't come out of the grave and say, ah, sheesh. No. His sisters didn't respond that way. No. He continues. This is beautiful because he tells them, you know, if listen, if Lazarus had free will, then why didn't he unbind himself? That's what it says. Why couldn't he even unwrap himself? He couldn't even do that. Comes out of the grave fully wrapped. Probably doing that little walk where you could only do this, right? Just unbind him, set him free. Lazarus couldn't give himself life, much less unbind himself. I, I want to be under that kind of control. I pray that you would be the same. You'd be like that. I cannot live without God. I, I live and have my being in Him. Turn, turn to Romans chapter 8. Look what it says about this miracle. Romans 8, verse 10. If Christ is in you, it means if you're regenerate, if you've been made alive, it says, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit, His Spirit, who dwells in you. You know, eternal life and salvation isn't for the future, it's for now. St. Corinthians 5.17 says, Whoever those, all those that are in Christ are our new creation. You've been made anew. 1 Corinthians 15.22 says, For as sin and Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. All those that believe will be made alive. 1 Peter 1.23 says this, You have been born again through the living and abiding word of God. How did Jesus call Lazarus out of the grave? With a word. Turn back to John. I want you to notice these last two verses in closing. Verse 45, it says, Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. So this first group, this first group, this is, if I could give you a fourth point, is this revival and rejection. So in verse 45, you see this revival. Many of the Jews believed in him. You know, true, true revival comes from true belief. True revival comes from true surrender. It's not worked up in emotions like today, what they call revivals, where there's very little preaching. It's like preaching is like an afterthought. It's just, it's just hours and hours of music. A true revival comes the way Christ deemed it to be so through the preaching. 
But you see this rejection. Look at verse 46. It says, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them things which Jesus had done. So their reaction, there's people that believed and those others that went to go snitch on Jesus. It's an odd response to seeing a man raised from the dead and their reaction is like, ah, I need to go tell on you. It's, it's like seeing the people live or that around you that are believers that love God and you see these lives that have been raised from death to life and their lives have been transformed and changed and, and your response is what? I, I don't believe it. Will you respond to Jesus' words like Martha did? Take you back again, this, this, this center verse, verse 25 and 26. It says, I'm the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. It says, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? You know, the denial, they, they, the Pharisees themselves didn't even deny that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. There was no denying it. But they still hated it. They still hated what that thing, that, that action imposed upon them. They had to respond to this truth that Jesus was no mere man. So will you turn from your sins Will you place your trust in the only Savior that this world has, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived the perfect life, that an atoning death that you deserve, and then rose from the dead to defeat the two things that you can never defeat, it's sin and death. And now this, this Jesus reigns from heaven. And he calls all flesh to repent. Do you believe this? Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is true and that every account of the life of our Savior is true and glorious. I pray now that you would solidify this thinking even within our own minds that as we come before your table to, in a sense, commune with you in remembrance, that you would direct our thoughts and our mind to remove all barriers. And even now, for those that have not yet come to know you, that you would grant them repentance and faith, that they would abandon their own suppose goodness and embrace the righteousness that only comes from your son, that they would be forgiven and stand before you guiltless because of your sacrifice. Lord, strengthen your church with these truths. We ask in Christ's name. Amen.